Hello, all students. This is the last online. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, the Rasa. And here is our subject, which is English language two. But again, here is our topic, which is appreciating literary works. And down here is a subtopic, which is basic concepts of literature. Now, in these uh, basic concepts, there are so many concepts regarding um, literature. So, as um, I will be sharing with you, these uh, basic concepts will be revolving on a question which asks. Here is our question. It asks, how can you describe a novel? And from this, you are taught to use six points. Students, um, the word describe, it should be very clear before you start attempting this question. Simply one can say, describe means giving details of something, explaining something into details, showing how it looks like. By showing such a details, then enable another person to understand. Then if one come across with uh, a book, then he or she will be able by telling that this is a novel and not a play, and this is a, a poetry and not a short story. This is not a novella. By just giving uh, the description. Students, now, we need to have an introduction. We need to introduce. In your introduction, you need to uh, clarify some of the key terms. And one of the key terms in this question is the term novel. So this is our basic concept that need clarification. Students, so um, now here uh, is a definition of a novel. Now here it goes that a novel is a long narrative work of fiction which is organized in chapters and paragraphs. So, uh, this is a very simple definition of a novel. Now, in this particular definition, I've underlined some of the key terms or some of the key words that whenever you are defining a novel, whenever you are telling a novel what the novel is. Now, these are the key terms. A novel is a long, is lo is a long narrative work of fiction which is organized in chapters and paragraphs. And of course, being a work of art or being a fiction, it reflects the social realities. It reflects what is happening on the ground or what is happening in the society. Now, having that said, now let us go uh, into depth of this question. Now, here we start giving the description of this concept a novel. Students, a novel is in narrative form. Now, you may ask yourself, what do you mean by, the, uh, by this particular term, narrative? A narrative means, or the word narrative is an uh, adjective whose verb is narrate. To narrate means to tell a story. So, um, here, we can have a storyteller who's narrating, who is telling a story about something. You can narrate a story either by, by the use of a first personal pronoun, which is I and we. Or you may narrate a story, you may narrate a novel by means of a um, uh, second personal pronoun, which is you. But again, one may narrate a novel, may tell a story by the means of um, third person pronoun, which is he, she, it, and they. These are pronouns that one may use to narrate a story. Now, a novel is, is in this particular form of narrative. One can start telling a story by the use of first personal pronoun, which is I. For example, one may start a story or his novel by saying, 
One day, when I was traveling to Bukoba, or one day, when I was traveling to Mikumi National Park, I saw different animals of different colors. And such animals were so beautiful. The animals were, were very, very attractive. As I was traveling, now, students, you can look at this. The word I, the pronoun I, has been used to narrate such a story. Now, it tells somebody's experience. It narrates a story about someone's experience. Or, one may use a um, uh, first person pronoun, a uh, plural, which is we. One may start his novel by uh, narrating or t uh, telling that uh, one day we were traveling to Mikumi. Now, the pronoun we, which is first personal pronoun plural, we. All these are techniques of narrating um, a story. And this particular feature now is found in the novel. Students, do you remember um, a novel uh, by Chinua Chebe, A Man of the People? Now, look there. There's the storyteller in that, in that particular novel is Odiri. He's the narrator of that particular novel. So, uh, in there, you find the first personal pronoun, I. Now, Odili knows everything. So he's telling people. He knows, uh, Odili knows about Chief Nanga. He's telling uh, all the things found um, in, that, in, in his particular society. He tells about uh, the way Nanga behaves. Similarly, if you go to a, a, a novel, a beautiful one, another born. Now, in there again, you may, you may see um, the way that particular novel has been narrated. Now, uh, you may use again uh, the, another form of narrating a story by use of you, of which this particular style is not so common, it's not so popular. People prefer to use, um, to narrate their story either by the first person pronoun, I and we, or by the third person pronoun, which is um, he, she, it, and they. Students, let us move to another feature that describes a novel. Here we come. A novel is long in, uh, in nature. Now, when you, when you describe a novel in, term, in terms of length, a novel is very long. It, co it contains so many pages. It contains so many words. If you read literature, now you may come across of, uh, seeing a novel of, say, um, 40,000 to 50 words. Now, uh, uh, this particular novel is very long. It contains so many pages, so many chapters, so many words. The reader may take even a week or may take weeks to finish uh, such a novel because it's very long. So if you are to compare a novel with a novella, a novel with a short story, now one would say a novel is long. It, it, has, it contains so many words. When one starts reading a novel, it may take him or her like uh, a week, three days. Now back to you. How many days did you take when you were reading a novel titled A Man of the People? Well, how long did it take for you to read a novel uh, titled The Beautiful Ones and the Born? So you may, you may just judge yourself. Then come back. How long did it take for you to read a short story? How are the bus driver? I believe now you can tell that maybe reading um, uh, that story about how the bus driver or reading a story uh, um, about the farm, any, any other short story, what may take even uh, two hours or an hour to finish uh, such short story or to finish such a novella because uh, they are considerably short compared to a novel. A novel is long. Students, let's just move to another feature that describes 
a novel. It says uh, a novel, a novel is organized in form of chapters. A novel can, uh, is organized in form of chapters. Um, and the chapters can be either long or short. And one novel can contain like 10 chapters, 15 chapters, 20 chapters, etc. It depends with the author. There are some authors or novel writers who are authors um, may compose a novel with, with so many chapters. And each chapter contains its own um, idea. Or within, within one chapter, it may contain, or within one chapter, may, may be so many ideas in there. Back to you. Um, a novel titled A Man of the People, how many chapters in there? The same thing to the beautiful ones. The same thing to other novels that you have, you have covered. How many chapters are there? This is unlike other literary works, which are in the form of um, uh, scenes and acts, or standards and, um, and verses. This is organized in this particular chapter. I'm not saying that every, um, every story that is in chapters, then it's a novel. Not that way. These descriptions should be treated uh, collectively, not uh, as a single description. Students, I'll say it again, back to chapters. The number of chapters in a novel varies from one author to the other. But again, you may find that one chapter contains so many ideas. There are other chapters that a single chapter contains a single idea. So this, again, depends on the author. Students, let's go uh, to the next description. Here it is. It says a novel is a fiction in nature. However, not all fiction are novels. When we speak about a fiction, a novel is a fiction. That uh, is a work of art which narrates, which explains things or explains and really things. It uh, uses creative language, imaginary characters. So, um, in this particular fiction, a novel is one of the fictitious work. Leave alone other short stories, a play, because all those ones fall in um, fiction. By containing this element of being fiction alone, doesn't, doesn't just try. There are other fictitious works which do not, do not qualify to be a novel. And that's why I say, um, not all fictions, fiction, are novels. A play is a fiction. A short story is a fiction. A novella is a fiction. The poem, or the poems, the, all these fictitious works, but do not qualify to be a novel. Now, in this particular uh, uh, concept now, you may ask one thing. You may ask yourself one question, that if a novel is a fiction, then we have the so-called non-fiction. In there, with non-fiction there, we speak about autobiographies. We speak about biographies. We speak about uh, research reports. We speak about speeches, essays. These are falling on the non-fiction. But a novel is a fiction, which means it involves the use of imaginary characters, creative language. Students, I believe uh, with this concept um, of fiction is clearly understood. But again, you should. It is very much important for you to understand also the concept of nonfiction. Such a concept should be at your fingertips. Students, let us move to the next point. A novel is meant to be read silently. It's unlike other works of art, which are meant to be uh, recited, like uh, poems, a drama which is acting on the stage, a play, which is in form of dialogue where two people speak uh, in turns. But a novel is meant uh, to be read sent by an individual. One may be traveling, for example. He's uh, in the fright, then um, he, takes, he or she takes his, um, his novel and starts reading silently. Back to you, have you ever seen a person reading a novel loudly, shouting? or uh, hearing, hearing his or her voice. One day, when I was traveling to 
No. A, a novel is primarily um, read silently. Remember, this uh, description should not be treated as at the level of individual point or at the level of um, um, individual description. Rather, should be treated collectively. Now, this feature or this description uh, for a novel being um, read silently is one of the features of the novel. Students, I just move to um, next point. Here we come. A novel is also uh, described by having uh, many incidents and many characters. When we speak about incidents, we speak about events portrayed in the given novel. And when we speak about characters, we speak about the participants in a given novel, that these participants are many. Now back to you. How many characters are there in the novel, The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born? How many characters again in the novel titled A Man of the People? And how many characters in any novel that you have read? You may count and you will agree with me. Or oh, you, you come to understand that it's true that novel uh, contains many incidents and uh, characters as well. But um, such incidents are organized in such a way that are well organized that the, uh, the intention or the objectives of the author is accomplished. The same thing to characters. Characters also are many, but each character has been assigned a role or a specific role to play. So, my dear students, this again is one of the uh, description of a novel. Remember, don't treat this feature or description individually. Treat these features collectively. Then you tell that this is a novel and not a short story and not a, a play and not a novella. Now, students, now, let us describe a play. How a play looks like. Here we come. How can you describe a play? So, um, a novel being a work of art, also a play is a work of art. Now, what are the features that describe a play? That when one comes across, or when one is in library, in there, there are so many books in the library then how can one tell that this is a play and not a short story? Or this is a novel and not a novella? And this is um, uh, a poem? So here again, let's just describe quickly what a play looks like by giving um, the details or the description of uh, such a play. So here we go. A play is in the form of dialogue where characters speak in turns. In other words, one would say that um, a play in the form of, of conversation where the participants, who are the characters, speak in turns. Now, um, take an example of a play that we have read in, uh, in, in class. Take an example of uh, a play titled An Enemy of the People, or I Will Marry When I Want, or uh, Betraying the City. Now, look the way Francis Mbuga, in that play, uh, uh, Between the City, the characters speak in turn, or speak one after the other. The times we hear the voice of Mulili, the times we hear the voice of, of uh, Jere, the times we hear the voice of Nina, and there comes the voice of Doga. And all these, they speak one after the other. Such a feature, or such a description, is hardly found in the novel. It's hardly found in a, in a poem. This is primarily found in a play. Remember, while in dialogue, these characters fulfill their assigned task or roles to play. The playwrights give words through these characters. Now, such a words from their mouth, they are being delivered in terms of dialogue. Again, remember uh, a play, An Enemy of the People, where one could hear the voice of Peter Stockman, but again, one could hear the voice of 
Thomas Tuckman, Catherine, Petra, Homestead, Billing, and other characters. All, all these characters speak in turns. And of course, I would say, when I read a play, which is uh, in this particular form, or one would say, uh, by, by a play being organized in form of dialogue, it brings a um, um, kind of joy. One finds fun reading um, uh, a play um, because of um, being in the form of dialogue. Or one enjoys reading a play just because it is in the form organized in a um, dialogical manner. Students, I'll just move to the next description. This is a description that a play is divided into acts and scenes where an act is a major division of a play, while scene is a minor division of a play. A playwright may decide that in this particular play, I will be having like five different acts. And in each act, there will be six or four scenes. And each scene contains its uh, own idea. Or each scene have um, two or three different ideas. Now, back to you. How many acts are there in your play that you have read? And how many scenes are there in your play that you have studied in your, um, in your class? Remember, this kind of uh, description is hardly found in the novel. A novel is in the form of chapters and paragraphs. But this one is in the form of acts and scenes. Students, let's just move to the uh, next description of a play. And here it is. That plays use stage direction. Now, what is the stage direction? Yes, a uh, stage direction is just a description or an instruction that explains or tells the audiences the movement, the transition from one event to another. State direction describe the setting, describe the exit, describe arrival or entrance, describe the feelings, describe the intonation, and the body movement of characters. And remember, such a, a, a words found in the state direction are in italic form or they have been italicized. Now, wh uh, what exactly when we speak, uh, when you say that uh, state direction or state direction uh, is a description. Now here is a state direction. A state direction, I said here, that is a, um, an instruction or a description which is written in italics. Such a description or instruction tells the movement of characters. It tells the feelings of the characters. It tells the, the arrival and exit of characters in a work of art or in a play, particularly. Now, such a words or a certain direction helps you to remain focused as you read um, a, a, a play. Now, um, such direction helps you to remain focused and um, uh, to follow such a play very well. For example, before the characters start speaking or start dialoguing or start the conversation. Normally, uh, such a conversation appear prior to state direction or such a conversation is preceded by a uh, state direction. For example, one may uh, start, um, may come across with, uh, this description or state direction when one uh, explains that Dr. Uh, Thomas Tuckman is at the sitting room as he waits for to take his breakfast, Catherine is busy at the kitchen. After half an hour comes his brother, who is the mayor of the town. Now, that, that is the stage direction. It explains the exit and the entrance. It explains about the setting that Dr. Thomas Tuckman is at the sitting room. 
waiting to take a breakfast or um, it tells how busy Catherine cousin is. Now such a word, such a description appears before the normal conversation and such a conversation, I mean such a words are in italics in some, in some place, such a uh, description is found in bracket. Now it will be easier for you to read uh, to four or a state direction may describe, may give, um, uh, may show the feelings of a character. For example, Dr. Stockman is at the sitting room, he's very furious, very disappointed for the fact that um, the news reporters refused uh, to publish his article. Why in such a confusion or disappointment comes Asalaxin or comes Petra? Now, the conversation uh, goes on. So, with that direction then, helps you to understand even the, the feelings or the mood of the characters. But again, even the intonation. Why at the sitting room, Dr. Stockman shout to his wife, Hey, Catherine! Now with that one, again, it's a stage direction that helps you to understand the feeling or the, um, the mood, the emotion of uh, characters. So from there again, you'll be following such a particular play very well. The same thing uh, when you read a uh, play, I'll remember when I want, go and find such a description or go and find a uh, stage direction where you see some words which have been um, italicized. And now, such a words um, uh, is a stage direction that helps you uh, to, to understand the movement of the characters, to understand the exit and entrance, to understand the feelings, to understand even, even, even the setting of that particular play. Students, let's just move to the next description. We are told that a play is meant to be acted or performed on the stage. The way the playwrights compose plays or compose uh, their work. They have been composed in such a way that uh, such a play can be transformed or can be performed on the stage. And once it is performed on the stage, it changes its name. It's no longer a play, it becomes a drama. Now given the fact that a play is in the form of dialogue or conversation, now it's easy such a, a play to be acted on the stage. And this, you can even uh, act a play out when I want in your class. The same thing, uh, you can act a play um, titled Between the City. You just give, uh, take the names of Jerry, Muriri, Jasper, Mosese, then take the words from the Mosese, take the words from Jerry, from Muriri, from Nina and Doga, then you act, you perform it on the stage or in your class. So the way a play is organized um, can be acted on the stage before the audience. Students, remember that um, if a play is transformed or is performed on the stage, it becomes a drama. A play, remember, a play is in script, is written. Then we read it. We are the audience, we read it, but it's meant to be acted. So, I, I assign you, I give you an assignment that think of acting all the plays that you have read in class. Find uh, people like Jerry, Muliri, Jasper, Nina, in your very class, then perform this kind of uh, play. It will be great. Students, now the other feature that describe a play is the use of first person pronoun point of view, which includes I, we, ours, etc. Now in the play, given the fact that a play is in the form of dialogue, now the characters use uh, such a uh, point of view. Now, you can ask yourself, 
what is the benefit or what is the uh, advantage of using first person pronoun? Obvious, uh, the, the use of first person pronoun um, connect the reader and the artist or the playwright simply because when a character um, uses first person pronoun I or we, you may find yourself as a reader, you get a feeling, you get connected. You find yourself, you feel uh, just the way is um, an artist or a playwright or freeze. Why? Because of the um, first person point of view. Now, take an example in the play that you have studied in the class. Say, between the city uh, and any of the people, I may want to want. Now, in there, no wonder there is a use of this uh, first person pronoun point of view, which is I. And when you start reading such a play, you find yourself excited. You get the feeling, the way the character feels, also, you get yourself, um, you get engaged. Students, this is unlike um, other um, point of view, like third person point of view, or second person point of view. This is different. So a play uses uh, this, this particular um, kind of point of view. Now, let's just move again to the next feature which describes a play. Students, each literary work has a special or a technical term to refer to an artist or to a person who prepares such a um, work of art. Now, in a play, in a play, an artist or a person who composes who writes uh, a, a play is called a playwright. It is unlike the other um, literary works, like a novel. Now, the person who prepares a novel is an author. And the one who composes a poem is a poet. Now, coming to a play, the person who uh, writes a play is a playwright. So again, this is the, another feature that uh, describes a play. Dear students, let us move to uh, another literary work, which is um, poetry. Now, here is our question. How can you describe a poetry? Use five points. Now, you may recall, we described a novel, we described a play. Now, this time around, it's about a poetry. It's another literary genre or literary work. Now, how can you describe it? It's very easy, and I believe uh, we will share uh, together. There may be five, or even more than five. There are so many. Uh, the features which describe a poetry. Now, here we go. A poetry is organized in the form of stanzas and verses. Now, you may ask yourself, how other literary works are being organized. So, um, this one, this very one, it is the form of stanza and verses. You may ask yourself, what, what is a stanza? Which I know that uh, you know it very well, and you can tell that a stanza is a group of verses which are put together in a poem. Now, again, you may ask yourself, what's a verse? Or what are the verses? These are just uh, lines. If a single is a verse, a verse is a single line in a poem. Now, a poet may decide, may compose a poem with several stanzas. And each stanza may have different number of verses. Now, if a stanza contains two lines or two verses, stanza is called a uh, corporate. Again, if a stanza contains uh, three uh, lines or verses, it tosses it. And again, if I'm to ask you, uh, can you tell, can you give an example of a poem uh, which has stanzas and in each stanza contains three verses? Yes, you may be able to tell. That poem is your pain. Now, go and look at that particular poem. And you may find that uh, each stanza has 
um, three verses or three lines. Now you may come to, um, again, a stanza which contains four lines or four verses. It's called Cotrain. A Cotrain, uh, this is a, a, a stanza which contains um, four lines or verses. Again, uh, Sestet. Assisted, assisted is a poem, a poem with six verses. Come to octave, a poem that contains eight verses, etc., etc. So, this is the assignment again that uh, when, when one asks you what is called train, what is corporate, what is tacit, what is octave, what is sexted, you'll be able to tell. Dear students, the other feature that describe a poetry is, it says a poetry is economic. Why economical? A poetry is economic in the sense that it uses a few words or the language which is used in the poem. It, it's that language which is very condensed, very condensed, using very few words. But the use of very few words expresses a broader information. It's unlike other literary works, like a novel, which is very long using a lot of words. But with this one, it is very economical. It uses very few words. Now, take an example of a poem titled It More. Take an example of a poem titled Your Pain. Now, uh, these poems are very short, contains very few words, but in there, there are a lot of information that have been communicated or have been portrayed in there. So, um, this kind of uh, literary work, it is characterized by the use of um, very condensed language, but expresses broader information. Now, the next feature that describes our poetry is, a poetry is rich in terms of figure of speech. This is to say that a poetry uses so many, or a lot of figure of speech. The word figure of speech means these are expressions which uses figurative language. And the figurative language is being employed just to decorate, just to color or to paint the work of art. By painting the work of art, it, it makes that work look so attractive. By being attractive now, you as a reader, you as a person who, um, uh, who is reading such a work, you find yourself being attracted. You can feel the way um, an artist feels. You can react the way an artist reacts just because of the use of such figurative language. Now, in this particular um, uh, point now, I can ask you, can you mention such a figure of speech? Of course, some are, are here. The metaphors, the personification, symbolism, hyperbole, etc. There are so many. So, uh, this kind of figure of speech of uh, figurative language is being found in uh, poetry. Next point, my dear students, is students, a poetry contains musical features or musical devices. What do you mean by uh, musical devices? Since a poetry is meant to be sung, now uh, it consists of um, um, music devices. When we speak about music devices, we speak about um, aspects or devices that enables a poem to be sung. The devices that bring musicality. Remember again, poetry or poems meant to be sung, unlike other literary works, which are meant to be, um, to be read, like a novel, a play of which we read. But the poetry is being sung. A drama is being acted, etc. So with this one, is meant to be sung. The devices which enable the poem to be sung is um, assonance, alliteration, uh, consonance, rhyme, rhythm, meter, foot, and the others. All these enable the poem to be sung. By being sung, or by, by the music that, we, that are found in a poem, you find yourself as a reader uh, rejoice. You get excited. Now, back again to you. Uh, what is alliteration? What is an assonance? What is a consonance? These devices have to be understood 
Now, let's uh, look one after the other quickly. We have here alliteration. Students, here we come. Alliteration is a form of repetition in which similar consonant sound appears at the beginning of each word in a verse. Let us go to an example of how that one works. Here we come. Uh, buy, buy, best, bite, basket, bar. Now look here. Uh, the similar consonant sound that appears at the beginning of each word in a verse. Now look at this verse here. The sound B. Buy, best, bite, basket, bar. So the, we have a sound here which has repeated at the beginning of which word. Now here the beginning of this word, uh, which is B. Again the second and the third, the fourth, and the fifth. Coming to the second verse. A free, fair, four, forward. Now sound f has been repeated at the beginning of each word. Now with this kind of repetition, brings, um, it creates music. By creating a music, you find, that you find yourself um, rejoice or um, excited just because of the sound which have been put in there. You, can, you may add even other, other examples of which again, I believe you know it. One will say, Fred fried fresh fish. Fred fried fresh fish. Now with this, uh, uh, Fred, Fred fries fresh fish sound f has been repeated. By being repeated, now you find uh, that particular uh, verse sounds very well. Students, this uh, with the alliteration or with the sound device, they create aesthetic. They make us uh, a poem being so attractive. Again, it appeals. You get appealed. You get uh, your feelings get evoked, and you find yourself um, enjoy and remember the poem very well. Next um, sound device is rhythm. Now, quickly, one can say a rhythm. This is a pattern, a pattern of stressed and unstressed syllable that appear in the poem. That that pattern, the rise and fall of the voice in a poem, uh, creates the so-called rhythm. Now, this rhythm, students, the next device is rhythm. So, uh, in the verse of the poem, there are some syllables which receive st stressed, and there's some syllables which um, are not stressed. With a stressed and unstressed syllables, my dear students, we speak about the rise. Syllables are being spoken with um, high pitch, and there are some syllables which are being spoken by low pitch. By doing so, uh, you create a rhythm. That means that the form, the raise and form, the raise and form. Now, you can understand rhythm by uh, looking at this very example. Here we come. A mouse is hiding in their house. Now, with this kind of um, a verse, this very one. Now, a mouse, the voice, a mouth, goes up, then is, goes down, then Hiding goes up, then uh, we have a preposition that in here goes down up to here, then house. Why all these? This is because it's a noun, one of the content words. This is a noun which receives a stress. By receiving a stress during pronunciation, your voice goes up. Again, hiding is a main verb here, so the voice also goes up. Here, it's a um, uh, helping verb. Again, uh, the voice goes down. Here again, it's a verb. Go the voice goes up. Here is a preposition. And here is uh, uh, this is a perfect pronoun. The voice goes uh, down. Also here, it's, it goes down. And the house here is a noun. It's a noun. So the, the voice goes up. So as one will be singing, now the voice will be going up and down, up and down. So this is a stressed and stressed, stressed and stressed, uh, stressed syllable or word. Students, the same thing to this one. Uh, the only content words deserve uh, uh, to be stressed are the ones which are, are being stressed. But the um, minor word class, non-content words or minor word class do not deserve a stress. So it's, they're being unstressed. So here, again, uh, no stress here. Uh, the voice will be just flat. 
then a goat, the voice will go, will go up. Here will go down. Eating will go up. Um, in is a preposition, the voice will go down. There is an article, the uh, voice will, uh, won't receive a stress. A boat uh, will receive a stress. So you find of yourself, your poem goes up and down, up and down, up and down. The up is stressed and down is unstressed. Dear students, the same thing you can do it by yourself. Um, Oliva is the name of the person, a star, a car. So this again, you can put a stress. This rat is fat. I believe um, now uh, you are able now to tell uh, where to put a stress and where to, uh, to put unstressed, or where not to put a stress. Students, let's just move to uh, consonants. Consonants is a repetition of consonant sound within verses in a poem. Typically, this uh, repetition occurs at the end of the words. But there are times it can occur even within the words. It's a consonant. So remember, uh, when we speak of the consonants, we speak of the repetition of consonant sound uh, within verses in a poem. And typically, at the end of, uh, of, of the verse. But there are times this, uh, the, this repetition occurs at the middle or within a verse. Now, let's look, look for an example. Here is an example. Mike, Mike, Jack, like, bike, toast, glass, cross, creep, beep, sleep. Now, here are the consonants which have been repeated at the end of a word in a um, given verse. So here, Mike and Jack like the bike. Now all these, there is a mu music features that we, um, we get from this particular verse. The same to the second verse and the third verse. That's the consonants. Next point. Students, let's go to the next point. Unlike other literary works, a poetry is meant to be sung. Now this point is similar this point um, is similar to the, the last point that we said that a poem has musical devices. Now, it's the musical devices which enable the poem to be sung. And this is contrary to other literary works, like a novel, a play, a drama. This one is primarily meant to be sung. So, um, let's just again move to the next point. Dear students, a poetry has a tendency of, uh, of arousing emotions and feelings. Remember, it uses very few words, but such a words evokes our feelings, appeals to our um, imagination, appeals to the, sense of, to the sensory organs, like the sense of, um, of seeing, of vision, testing, uh, seeing, etc. All these make the, um, when one reads, when, when one read the, the given poem, now he or she find himself or herself being uh, compared or being appealed. For example, if one uses words like, her words block my heart into pieces. With this kind of words, or, or example, that somebody's words break, uh, break, break somebody's heart into pieces. Now, you, can, you create kind of a, a mental picture in your mind that how is it possible or oh, some, someone's words breaking somebody's heart. Now, you start creating a mental picture. Students, let's just look at this simple quiz that wants you now to identify what kind of, uh, of uh, sense or um, sensory organs. How do you feel when, one, when you come across with this particular sentence? that he went to a stinking washroom. Obvious is uh, the smell, the sense of smell, that such a washroom is stinking. It's a rotten, uh, rotten kind of smell. So one will develop kind of um, um, sense of smelling of something. Then I heard soothing voice penetrating slowly in my ears. This again, you, you get a sound, you get a sense of sound, that somebody's uh, voice is some, somebody. I heard a, a soothing voice. Now, with a uh, soothing voice, you get a feeling of a sound. 
how uh, it sounds. The same thing to what is salt food. Now, the kind of feeling that you get is tasty. That this person, this, that, that food he or she eats, is very, it has too much salt. It contains too much salt. The same thing, Lugano's hair feels smooth. Now, we get the sense of touch. How Lugano's uh, hair feels. So, oh, when, this, when you come across with these sentences now, you find yourself being, um, your feelings are being evoked. You appeal to uh, emotions. Now, having this said, my dear students, let's just now look at the questions or the um, alternative questions that also are very much important for you to be understood. Now, here are the questions. Look here. You ask here, how can you differentiate a fiction from non-fiction? My dear students, uh, this term fiction includes all the artistic works which are imaginative, expressing unreal situation or unreal events. It includes all fabricated works where we see uh, uh, the use of imaginary characters, we see the use of uh, creative language, we see the use of um, imaginary setting, we see plot, we see all the diction in these particular works. And the fiction of fictitious works includes novels, which we have already discussed. A play is found here in the fiction. Poetry, short stories, novella, novelette, all these are found in this particular category. Now, while a non-fiction, non-fiction, now this includes all the works that expresses factual events or real situation involving real human beings. Now in this uh, non-fiction includes biographies, autobiographies, includes uh, re uh, research reports, includes essays, speeches, all these four under this aspect of non-fiction. These are the facts. All the autobiographies are facts. The autobiography of uh, Nelson Mandela, the autobiography of um, Martin Luther King, these are facts. Ev evidences. The autobiography of Benjamin William Kappa, even other biographies that um, you have come across. These fall under this particular uh, section. Now, how a novel is different from autobiography? How a play is different from a research report? How poetry is different from a speech or an essay? Now, with this kind of um, um, tips, I believe uh, you'll be able now to attempt to differentiate um, a, a, a fiction uh, from a non-fiction. Similarly, when it comes to a play, how can you differentiate a play from a novel? What kind of details, what kind of um, description that a play, ha um, a play has and a novel do not, or are not found in the novel, are not found in the drama, are not found in the poetry? So, with this question now, you should understand it very well. You should understand the description of a drama. You should understand the description of a, po uh, of a poetry. Also, you should understand the de description of a play. Again, understand the description of a novel. You may even go far of understanding the description of a short story, a description of a novella, all these um, literary concepts that need to be understood very well. My dear students, this marks the end of our, of our session today. Thank you so much for this, uh, for your attention. Thank you for your time. Till next time.